but it's being, um, you know, studied by the DEA to be, you know, placed in Schedule One any day now. Um, it's quite psychedelic. Um, it's smoked or in, um, it's 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 smoked primarily. Uh, you know, some people snort it. Um, it says, you know, it it's, uh, starts to work as quickly as DMT does. It's about ten times as potent on a milligram per milligram basis. You know, so in other words, a you know full dose of DMT, if you smoke it, is around is um, is around 40 milligrams, and um, you know to get the same kind of intensity of effect with you know 5 methoxy DMT, is closer to three to five milligrams, and you know people differ in you know their responses uh, you know to these drugs, but if you wanted to make a you know generalization and in uh, terms of characterizing the properties of one versus the other. You know, DMT tends to be more visual, and, you know, 5-methoxy-DMT, uh, you know, tends to be, you know, more of a, a flash into the white light. Um, you know, the DMT experience is, uh, you know, more visually art articulated. It's a lot more complicated visually than, you know, 5-methoxy-DMT. Well, how how would you say that it compares to traditional uses like ayahuasca, which has been used for thousands and thousands of years? Uh, well, so how does what compare? Well, like smoking it or taking it through an IV. Com uh, you mean DMT? Yes, yes. Oh, uh, you know, DMT uh, isn't orally active. Um, if you just, uh, you know, swallow DMT, it isn't really going to be doing anything because there are enzymes in the gut that break it down quite quickly before it can get into the bloodstream. Um, so the native populations in Latin America uh, discovered that if you combine plants containing DMT with other plants containing an inhibitor of those enzymes, um, then you can swallow the plants containing DMT, and the DMT is, is orally active. Um, that, that's MAOI, right? It, well, yeah, the enzyme in uh, the gut that breaks down DMT is MAO, or you know, mon monoamine oxidase, right? Right, and uh, the inhibitors of that enzyme in the companion plants are called monoamine oxidase inhibitors, or MAOIs. And they allow the DMT to actually come out th through the ayahuasca into your brain. Yeah, well, um, it allows the ayahuasca to hang around in uh, the gut, you know, long enough to be able to be oh. transported into the bloodstream and, you know, from there to the brain. Uh, you know, it, in the studies that I did and, you know, when people use DMT on the street, um, you know, in order to bypass uh, the fact that it's broken down in the gut, it's either smoked or injected or snorted. Um, you know, so the main difference in... Uh, in uh, in uh, terms of you know the, in 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 terms of the difference of you know the routes of administration um, is the speed you know so if you smoke DMT or if you inject DMT it starts you know to work extremely quickly within a few heartbeats within a few seconds um, and the, and the, uh, the peak effects are over oh well uh, uh, um, the peak effects occur within a couple of minutes or so. You start coming down thereafter, and you're, you know, fairly normal within a half hour to 45 minutes. Um, if you swallow, you know, DMT in uh, the form of ayahuasca, um, it'll start, you know, it'll start working in a half hour to an hour. Uh, um, you know, the peak effects um, occur within two to three hours, and um, are resolved at, at around four to six hours. Uh, but I think qualitatively. Uh, you know the visual and you know psychedelic aspects of you know the DMT are quite comparable. Uh, um, you know the major difference is um, in uh, terms of the time course. Right. So the ayahuasca lasts a lot longer, um, but um, it's not quite as deep, not yeah. quite as profound as smoking it. It it can be, you know, depending on the dose. You know, the thing about smoke DMT or injected DMT is it starts so quickly. You really mm -hmm. can't prepare or, you know, build up, you know, to it. You just fly off, right? Right. You just, you know, you're just kind of, you know, blown out of a nuclear cannon, you know. And, you know, with the ayahuasca, you have, you know, some time to orient, you know, towards the effects and respond to it, you know, kind of, you know, move along with it um, a bit more comfortably. You know, but, but still, I think in uh, terms of the depth and the, you know, profundity of the material that one can, you know, access, um, I, you know, think that ayahuasca, you know, um, it can just give you some more time to kind of keep your eyes open. 
you know, with smoked or um, it, it, when you inject or you smoke DMT, um, you just you, know, um, you just kind of have to hold on, you know, to your seat. <laughs> it all happens too yes. fast. It just so happens, yeah. Um, it you know just uh, um, it, it you know happens so quickly. Um, it can be you know rather disorienting. Well, when you administered the DMT, did you use an IV? And also, were your subjects ever blindfolded during their experiences? Yeah. Um, well, we gave the DMT intravenously, so that's about as quickly as you can get it into you know somebody's bloodstream. Um, and uh, in the first few you know volunteers um, that we studied, uh, we just asked you know people to keep their eyes closed, but. Um, it was kind of disorienting in those folks because they opened their eyes either to look around at the room or in response, you know, to the shock of the intensity of, you know, the onset of effects. And uh, in either case, it was kind of disorienting, you know, for them, you know, especially because the visions of the DMT would oftentimes be overlaid, you know, in, into the room, you know, the visual field of the room. Um, you know, so it could be kind of confusing. You know, so after a couple of months, we uh, just started putting a blindfold on on uh, on the volunteers. I, I, you know, one of those little, um, you know, silk, uh, you know, kinds of eye shade things that you used if you're going to be sleeping in the middle of the day. They're comfortable and they're silk and, you know, aren't intrusive at all. You know, so if you, I and, um, you know, subsequently, if the volunteer did open his eyes or her eyes um, in response you know, to the onset of effects, um, it would still be kind of, you know, dark around, you know, um, so they would just kind of close their eyes and, you know, get back into the experience that way. What were your thoughts before um, the study and how did they change afterwards? Uh, well, my thoughts about what? About uh, DMT. And psychedelics in general. Well, um, let's see, that's a... That's a big question. You know, I you know kind of came into this study. Uh, well, I'm a clinical psychiatrist, and I trained in you know biological psychiatry and you know psychoanalytic, you know Freudian kind of psychiatry. Um, also, I had uh, undergone a fair amount of you know work and training with the Zen community. Um, you know, so I felt I was, you know, fairly well equipped to understand the kinds of things I was going to be seeing uh, or the kinds of reports I was going to be hearing from the DMT volunteers. Um, and, you know, I, I was thinking that I would be armed or equipped with interpretive tools and conceptual, you know, frameworks that could contain and understand and kind of help, you know, people um, interpret their DMT experiences. But the thing that I was most struck with and surprised by and ultimately really unable to explain um, was what seemed to be the external sort of independent freestanding nature of people's experiences, you know, the worlds that they seem to encounter. You know, all three of those models, you know, the biological and, uh, you know, the Zen and, you know, the Freudian, you know, psychoanalytic, all of them place a, a you know, primacy on uh, the mind as you know generating the phenomenon as opposed to just perceiving the phenomenon and um in the case of my volunteers it, it um you know they all kind of rejected on any possibility of their minds uh, you know generating what it was that they were perceiving they were much more inclined to you know to propose or to you know believe that they were just you know perceiving you know, something that they, you know, couldn't perceive, you know, previously. You know, in the beginning, I kind of interpreted away, you know, their interpretations, but that just didn't work. Um, you know, they rejected that. They got defensive. Um, and, you know, these guys were sophisticated, you know, psychedelic um, explorers. Uh, you know, they were doctors and, you know, they were lawyers, you know, psychologists and psychotherapists. You know, they were all stable, you know, contributing members of the community. You know, so they just weren't these, you know, kind of weird, freaky people. Uh, you know, some of them were better trained and smarter than I am. Um, well, did you ever find that any of them lost their sense of reality, such as this world isn't real or maybe the DMT world is more real than what we're experiencing now? Well, I... Uh, I'm um, not really. No, there was one guy in particular um, 
who came in oftentimes uh, for some of the pilot preliminary work we were doing with a drug called psilocybin. So he got slightly unhinged as you know time went on. 